There we go. All right. I do apologize. It's a little bit, uh, maybe it's a little smaller than usual, but this is Tom Froses from the Embodied Cognitive Science Unit at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, Graduate University in Onasan, Okinawa, Japan. Interesting. Okay, so let's put the uh, background music down a little bit. So, all right, there we go. All right, so let's read this commentary. <coughs> and as always, Please ask questions along the way. This is my first time reading it, too. If you have anything I will, you want me to explain better, I will make an attempt at it. No guarantees. Onward. Deacon 2021 addresses the question of how complex organic molecules, such as nucleotide sequences that make up RNA and DNA, first came to be characterized by a code-like informational code code is it codependence or codependence? Yeah, codependence in the context of the origin of life. This return to the origin of life is a strategic move by Deakin, which serves the purpose of developing a minimal model of a possible physical implementation of what he calls, following the tradition of biosemiotics, the interpretation of sign vehicles. Deakin's approach aligns closely with the inactive approach to autopeosis and adaptivity. Living is sense-making at its core and from its very start. Yet there are also some productive differences between these approaches that are worth exploring in more detail. The most fundamental difference lies in distinct criteria of what would count as a successful explanation. Deacon adheres to a narrow form of naturalism in which the only permissible explanatory factors are those captured by the natural sciences. The inactive approach tends to adopt a more relaxed form of naturalism in which the subjective side of life can also make a difference in its own right, including normativity and including normatively to how its behavior unfolds. It is this qualitative transition from non-normative to normative, which is a transition that goes beyond mere chemistry that is at the root of why the origin of life remains such an intractable problem. Researchers in artificial life and synthetic biology pursuing the creation of life from scratch are faced by a profound challenge to create a novel system that is sensitive to a normativity that is not derived like that of all our other artifacts, but is intrinsic to that system. Okay, so basically this is asking... Right here is the crux, and this is what they're saying. If you're going to talk about normativity, what is normativity? It means there's something out there that is, you know, has like an independent directedness. An independent directedness in this case is like usually you could say like a teleology is, um, you know, a God-given like destiny of the universe. So everything is sort of going in that way. A normativity is like, well, look, uh, a social norm is like, well, you shouldn't be murdering people. And so that's kind of how that goes. You shouldn't be murdering people. And so people should be going away from murdering people. That's just what a norm is. So the question here is, how did life all of a sudden get the norm to preserve itself? Compared to all the other things we might make, which is in some sense our conception of what we think the thing is to be. Because like, you know, here's my water glass. The water glass... You know, in some sense, its purpose is so that I can drink water. All of our artifacts have something to do with us. There's a pencil. Pencils have to be held so that I can write with them and, like, manipulate them to make marks on a page. All these things are directed by human desires, our norm, all, things that we want. So they're set up to us. So here's, like, the crux of the question. How does something gain a normativity that from, from nothing? Like, we have ideas about what we want and what we're trying to do, but nothing else, like, if there is no life to begin with, how did it all of a sudden gain the idea of, like, doing something to, like, self-replicate itself? And you might think it might just come out of nowhere and it just is what happened, but that doesn't explain anything. That's just describing that it showed up. And so the author here is asking, basically, um, the very hard question of the destiny of, like, how did the inanimate universe gain a destiny to be alive and the heideggerian the destiny is just terrible but yeah oh what's going on having some trouble with my stream deck that's okay 
How did intrinsic normativity originate in nature? An important clue can be found in the fact that living systems must continually do work, metabolically and regulatory, regulatorily, to even exist. In contrast to even in purely physical systems, which merely happen without any sense of their consequences, activity in biological systems essentially involves doing things for a purpose, that is, trying or striving, which implies a normative condition for their consequences, especially for the possibility of continued existence. The doings of, ulti of living ultimately matter to the living because of mortality. So I'm trying to fix the stream deck. The possibility of success or failure is intrinsically related to possible to possibility of life or death. Indifference is not an option. Okay, so sure, I guess like that we have to do something to stay alive is uh, separates us from non-living things because like you know, hydrogen atoms will just remain hydrogen atoms, I guess, until the death of the universe. But Otherwise, they just stay. They just remain. Uh, anything obviously busted? I don't see why. No, nope, nothing is obviously busted. Why is this not working? We will find out. Or we won't. Who knows? Continuing. Thus, the origin of life does not consist only in an increase in in an increase in the complexity of chemical organization, it is also the point at which the biological normativity for the first time comes into play a role on our planet and possibly in the whole universe. To do justice to this qualitative transition, it will be necessary first to make conceptual room in the natural sciences such that normativity can make a difference on its own terms beyond the determinations derived from its physical implementation. Second, there is still the unresolved challenge to being to explain how this initial form of life with its basic normativity of doing for the sake of being increases in complexity in an open-ended manner. For this latter part, it will become crucial to explain the origin of the genetic code. In what follows, I will mainly focus on the more philosophical aspects of the first issue, and I will finish by ske sketching some of the implementation aspects of the second issue. Right, let me just try one more try. Come on. Come on, thingy. Work, would you? Shut it down. Restart. No idea. No idea if it's going to work. All right. Says it's working. Don't know why it's not. Uh, lots of errors in the last few days. I have no idea why. On the basis and efficacy of normativity, Deakin positions his model as a counterpoint to classic modern biology as epitomized by Dawkins' selfish, selfish gene and the RNA world scenario of the origin of life, which reduces the process of inter interpretation of information to mere molecular replication. His ambition is to develop an alternative to this reductionist position by making it intelligible how a molecular structure, which in itself is just a physical pattern, could have informational content that is, be about something. And this in turn leads Deacon to develop his model as a minimal physical implementation of the process of interpretation. Okay, so wh what the heck is going on? Um, I don't know enough about Deacon as the issue. This thing's annoying me. The core of Deacon's autogen model is the self-organizing dynamics of two codependent processes, reciprocal catal cata catalysis and capsid self-assembly. It is therefore a variation on the fam familiar theme of bounded self-production, which includes a long and venerable tradition of proposals at various levels of abstraction, including autopeiosis, autocatechinetic closure, autonomous agent, basic autonomy, and the metabolism repair system. Luisi provides oh, come on. Luisi provides an extensive Ooh, maybe it worked that time. Nope, did not. Luisi provides an extensive review of such metabolism first approaches to the origin of life, including of the mem many efforts to realize their physical implementation. It is a pity that Deacon does not engage more with this ex extant literature because it remains unclear in which premise respects his auto in which precise respect wait yeah in, in which precise respects his autogen model is an advance over the state of the art in this field with respect to grounding normativity 
Hmm. So his is called Auto Gem, but apparently does not know the author cannot figure out compared to what. So it's like which one of these is uh this against, I guess, except for all of them. What is innovative about Deacon's proposal is the cast bounded self production in terms of Peirce's theory of signs. He provides a step by step semiotic theory of the normativity involved at the transition from the origin of life to the origin of the genetic code. Another conceptual novelty of Deacon's proposal is that he explicitly defines his model of bounded self production as a kind of non parasitic virus. This has the virtue of highlighting that, at the system level, self production self-producing systems can be characterized by an inert form which reveals hidden tension with deacon's appeal to it act to active adaptation as the basis of normativity what does this mean hidden reveals a hidden tension with deacon's appeal to active adaptation as the basis of normativity huh we're self-producing systems by characterized by an inert form but then we need the normativity all right Deacon is not alone with this problem. The identification of the default state with an inert state is also a feature of famous cybernetic models of adaptation, including ultra-stability and classic autopeiosis. In Deacon's model, the initial state even consists in a stop of all processes inside a static capsid with an inert form. Hence, catalysis and self-assembly are only temporary reactions to an extrinsic disruption that led to the loss of boundary integrity. At an abstract level, this model belongs to the class of generic physical systems that when pushed out of the st stable equilibrium by independent factors will mount counteracting forces that allow it to reconverge. It can therefore be doubted whether this kind of extrinsically, extrinsically caused reactivity is sufficient for Deacon to attribute to the system any kind of intrinsic activity. If this shift from extrinsic to intrinsic cannot be secured, the model will be lacking the most essential ingredient on which Deacon's semiotic notion of normativity depends. All right, so I guess what this means is that, look, you've got like some sort of like physical stuffs and then at a certain point it's alive or whatever and it comes up and it's doing new things. It's like trying to preserve itself or whatever this, uh, you know, from a default state and then it moves into like something else that is over and above what it used to be. But that means it had to get, you know, perturbed extrinsically and then from there on it sort of like kept going. But once it got going, that means it had to take that interesting way it got perturbed by the outside world and bring it into itself to continue along that uh, way. So in some sense, it has to have adopted a uh, whatever this extrinsic disruption is which they're talking about right there and that has to become part of the life the disruption that caused life has to somehow become part of life so as a comparative case consider Deacon's rejection of selectionist accounts as inadequate for grounding active adaptation and normativity given that the external environment does all the work the question is therefore how to characterize the condition of living such that it is not subject to similar criticisms. The three-decade history of the inactive approach reflects the search for an answer to this question, which ultimately has resulted in a more refined understanding of intrinsic activity. Yeah. Yeah, see, I don't know enough about this stuff, but it's interesting. How does it actually... Yeah, how, like, how, what is the background of this question? It's an interesting question. So, I mean, I guess this is, like, the main point here. Like, how did life get caused? Well, like, this sort of, like, what is the, um... If you think that life is in any way different from just non-life, then how does life have, uh, you know, and this is a very old point, of course, you know, a something that drives it from the from its get go, like a, a soul in the old uh, sense in the old Greek sense that like a, a self animating thing. But like, how does any how does life in some sense rep have this sort of uh, property? How does that get internalized? So the transfer of the soul from the the motion of the universe to become something uh you know localized in life is um the comp is the question here 
And the question is, is there a difference in complexity between uh, like living things and non-living things? And how did that happen? So I guess maybe that's really the question here. Where did, how did complexity get um, internalized in life? So uh, let's see. Whoopsie. How did life get complexity at all? See, that's the question here. How did life get complexity at all? Like any unique complexity compared to anything else? Um... I have no idea. Like, that's the question. It's like, if you think life is more complex than anything else, then how did that happen at some point? All right, so continuing. The idea that boundary rep repair could serve as the basis for normativity goes back to the very initial formulations of the inactive approach. Consider Varela's proposal that autopeosis can serve as the basis for a bio biology of intentionality. It is precisely the concept of a breakdown of an otherwise static identity and the system's initiation of an adaptive response which motivates the claim that a meaningful world shows up for the organism. Quote, The source for this world-making is always the breakdowns in autopeosis, be they minor, like changes in concentration of some metabolite, or major, like disruption of the boundary. Due to the nature of autopeosis itself, Excuse me. Autopeosis itself, illustrated in the membrane repair of the minimal simulated example above, every breakdown can be seen as the initiation of an action on what is missing on the part of the system so that identity might be maintained. Okay, so this is saying that it could be anything, any breakdown, any like, so you have some natural process, but anytime that breaks, that could be the get go for life. Like Deacon's model, Varela's initial proposal can therefore also be criticized as insufficient for active adaptation. However, since then, several conceptual advances have been made, which can be briefly summarized as follows. First, there was an explicit recognition that a proper grounding of normativity requires that the source of the system's vulnerability to disruption has to be expanded from the extrinsic environment to the intrinsic constitution of the living, which came to be referred to as their precariousness. Second, it was recognized that a graded and differentiated perspective of, the sen of sense-making required a system capable of more states than, than self and non-self. In contrast to Deacon's claim that this zeroth level of semiosis include a sign of non-self, and that even this is given. Everything would have an absolutely positive sense as long as self exists, or an absolutely no sense at all, no self exists. One proposal for grounding a range of normativity was that the system is sensitive to the rel relative amount of effort that is required for its adaptive responses to keep the state of essential variables away from its boundary of viability. Third, adaptive adaptivity was rooted in this instability of bounded self-production as such. There is an irreducible tension in the system between satisfying the needs of self-individuation or boundedness being closed being, being as closed as possible to the environment, and the needs for self-production being as open as possible to the environment. This enables us to define active ad adaptation as the spontaneous change of system configurations whereby the mutually exclusive conditions of bounded self-production are iterative iteratively and always only partially solved. A key move, therefore, is to characterize the default state of the living system as intrinsically unstable, which at the same time enables us to characterize it as intrinsically active yeah life has to do stuff and i guess the, what they're saying is that the world has to have like kind of done something um puts itself in sort of like a unstable state and that unstable instability is what keeps life gives life the chance to do things but also gives life the chance to fail at doing anything and like revert back to just being non-life this still leaves the still leaves open the bigger mystery of how these spontaneous reconfigurations of the system are subject to normative regulation as such. 
how does the value associated with satisfying normative conditions enter this scenario? Like, yeah, how does, if so, like some sort of complexity starts growing, how does that complexity not just sort of destroy itself? Why does it want to self-replicate and produce more life in some sense? A clue is that the irreducible partialness of each of the adopted configurations points to an essential incompleteness at the core of the living, which also resonates with Deacon's own emphasis on the incompleteness of nature when we probe it for a phenomena of intentionality. Pushing these ideas further, we could start to view the role of normativity not as a specific cause, which is always in danger of collapsing into just another physical determination, but rather as precisely the relative absence or bracketing of physical determination. I don't really like this. Was God of the gaps? Just like, all right, so what? Where we can't find what we're looking for? That's where uh, life is. I find that kind of odd. It's a life of the gaps, not God of the gaps in this case. The physical indi yeah. Let's uh, make a note of that. This is a. Uh what was that? No. Oh, three. Uh, oopsie, not even doing the right thing. It's the life of the gaps, not God of the gaps. So. Life of the gaps. And let's fix my G. Okay, so this is what the article is kind of saying right here. It's like, okay, well, what we don't know is the is how life gains intentionality, like a directedness to do something, and that's where we that's where um, the determinism of physical space, physical determination, breaks down. I hate, like, I, I don't like this. Um, I mean, yes, but it feels like hand-waving. It's like, okay, 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 okay. We've got determinism all over the place where science is. Everything else is that's where life actually happens. I find that, uh, you know, ad hoc. Why does life happen in all the spots we can't look at? That makes no sense to me. Okay, the physical indeterminacy that would be associated with the normative dependencies could then be measured in terms of uncertainty measure, measures like entropy. Yeah, hiding it in the entropy. Why would that oh, arbitrarily just put it where we can't look at it? Intriguingly, this suggests a new way of considering the link between the origin of life and the principle of maximum entropy production, which deserve to be explored in more detail elsewhere. Now, of course, life could be in the entropy and be playing with it, and there might be reasons to do to look there. That's a fine investigation. The idea of defining it at that point uh, here and saying, oh, it is over there. I have no reason to think it's there. Like, it's just that's where we haven't looked yet. It's like, but, yeah, sure, maybe. Okay. There are additional implications for placing instability and incompleteness at the core of the living. Once this dynamic interplay between openness and closedness becomes part of the system's own regulatory process, the concept of a rigid boundary like a capsid is no longer an appropriate model. A more permeable boundary like a chemical gradient may be a more suitable starting point for this active system-environment interaction. But such fluidity brings along its own challenges of adaptability and evolvability, which depends on a on more solid molecular structures, so perhaps life originated on the surface of droplets. From this more dynamic starting point, a key step on in the increase of system complexity will have to do with increasing state dependence of internal and interactive behavior. In line with Deacon's proposal, this suggests that suggests the genetic system first started as a stable memory system, which only later became involved in transmission across generations. But as he also recognizes, this still falls short of explaining the origins of the genetic code. There is a missing mechanism that can account for the transition from an individual's memory system to a cross-generational genetic system. A possible mechanism for the origin of the genetic code is that is consistent with Deacon's proposal is based on horizontal gene transfer. Simulation models show that even molecular sequences with an initially arbitrary association between genes and proteins spontaneously take on code-like structure as long as they are iteratively passed between systems that only partially acquire its correlational mapping, similar to the iterated learning paradigm in language evolution. 
Okay, so this is just saying that code light things do just pop up in certain times under certain situations. All right, fair enough. This iterative approach seems to be in tension with the fitness cost of changing the mappings of the genetic code, which is why some stupid thing, stop breaking. Hey, it worked this time, 15th time of charm. This iterative approach seems to be in tension with the fitness cost of changing the mappings of the genetic code, which is why some favor scenarios wherein a static code originates as a whole, like a frozen accident. But the highly ordered nature of the genetic code makes that scenario highly unlikely, and the worry about costly changes could be addressed by envisioning a scenario initially involving non-deleterious changes, including expansion of the code by increasing the number of nucleotide letters. I mean, I have no idea like how, what they're arguing about here. It's like static code changes and like other things. Like, okay, so the idea, I guess, of a frozen accident is, did like at some point just an RNA strand show up by dumb luck? And then all of a sudden, you know, start replicating itself. Who the hell knows? Like a frozen accident. Like it just like a perfect RNA strand popped up or self, something that could self-replicate. Maybe. But again, that might be completely unlikely given the complexity needed here. And so then why didn't it just break down? And if it's so common as to just, you know, maybe not being that unusual, then again, why did the universe make this? Like, how did that actually happen too? We have no idea why would the, it be so easy to make um, self-replicating code. That doesn't seem like that would make sense either. Okay. This model of the origin of the genetic code is suggestive, but leaves several key questions unsolved. First, it requires a spatially contained population of proto-living systems at a relatively advanced stage of complexity, which runs counter to Deacon's claim that life arose by accident. Yeah, how, like, why would that, it have to be a really complex set of uh, stuff that just showed up? However, there are compelling pre-biological mechanisms that could account for their design, such as population-level proto-cell optimization in the wet cycles of archaean ponds. Second, the model leaves unclear the origin of horizontal gene transfer. Yeah, and so once you have that, even have proto-things, how do these things sort of get better by transferring code back and forth? That's a horizontal gene transfer, like between two things at like sort of similar level, not like parent child, not that'd be genetic, but like not horizontal. An intriguing possibility is suggested by Deacon's development of Dyson's two stage origin of the genetic, no, the, the genetic code, according to which nucleotides first stored and transported chemical energy in non reactive forms, and these molecules only later acquired code like properties. Horizontal gene transfer can then be conceived as originating in the context of a population of protocells participating in a network of energy exchange. Okay, yeah, so if you've got like some like little bubbles transferring energy around, maybe then they could, you know, start doing it in a more complex way. I don't know. Conclusions. More work clearly needs to be done to flesh out all these ideas. Yet, taken together, it is evident that they are pointing in a very different direction than pa the passive individualism implied by the autogen model. Rather than grant grounding normativity by starting from a static, solitary, and self-contained system, we are left with a sense of the fundamental role of intrinsic instability, openness, and interactivity. Now it's busted again. This suggests that we should consider an altogether different starting point. For instance, a more suitable proposal for the origin of life could be in terms of the emergence of an organic geosphere, a global network of chemical reactions that was particularly suited to reducing the energetic gradients that had been produced by the pre-theoretic pre-organic geosphere. This leads to a final speculation. Perhaps zero level normativity first originated along with this whole biosphere, which maximized energy flow via self-production and only later complexified in terms of individual perspectives when self-production became partially bounded. Okay, so where the hell does life come from? No idea. How did how does life get more and more complex? That's the whole question. How does it get so complex? Because, you know, the physics as far as we know, of course, this is not, um, we only can see things like 
for real in like a very small space and then we have like telescopes and stuff that see light from a long way off but the light has to make it here so in some sense there's like a bubble of like what we can actually look at in any complexity and everything else is just inference about things happening very far away that said you know physics just does as it does it's just sort of like you know it follows its laws it follows the laws of physics and so if it's just following those laws and we can figure them out we figure out some of them they follow some mathematical regularities i mean you can talk about like exactly how law like they are but they do follow some regularities um one way or the other because we can predict stuff that's basically the gold standard if there was no reason to think there would be an eclipse and then due to our predictions about how the sun the moon and uh the earth move we can predict an eclipse and that's and we can predict it away in the future and all of a sudden we're dead on which we are usually nowadays with this sort of thing like there's no reason to think that like it wasn't following those uh mathematical uh models at least somewhat so the question is but how do we get life where it's like it is just getting more and more complex we are not following the same rules of uh complexity now you might say well we're following we're building up and up and up and up and up and up and more and more and more little uh things from the physics to make more complex uh outcomes sure but then why is there self-replication are we just like some sort of weird um sort of fractal anomaly of the physics maybe but then again why would we just be the weird fractal anomaly of the physics and why wouldn't that be all over the place so again how did the complexity go here now this gives me a massive uh you know feeling of like well okay they, they just want to say well god did it or something like there's something this is like we have no explanation and so they're trying to look for a normative one and it's just like well we can't figure it out so something more uh, outside this happens but they're trying to drill down where exactly did this possibly happen and they're saying look there was a day before any life existed and then there was a day after and at some point the world created a system by dumb luck or what whatever other reason that put the complexity to be self-replicating and more complex in some way it made it life more complex but also more restricted to make it more like itself and how did that actually happen that one move where as opposed to any other just physical process the similarity and complexity just sort of increased at the same time in the same spot so yeah how from the extrinsic disruption one day there wasn't life until the next day where this sort of intrinsic thing where life contained the ability to replicate and complexify so and they don't know how that's why it's the life of the gaps they don't know how this happened and they're thinking well there's there's something normative and that is in the gaps of between what's physically determined now i don't buy that sort of like i said i don't like it's an old saying god of the gaps that god works in the areas that we don't uh we can't look at which is the physical area so god works everywhere else well this is saying life of the gaps or normativity of the gaps that normativity exists in the space where we just can't look yet and that's where it is now beyond the obvious thing that we can always see more and more because our science is getting better and so that means like life is ha always having a or god or whatever is having a smaller and smaller uh little bit of space to work in of course they, that doesn't matter if you're god you can always work with whatever and life again if it's normativity it's acting on all things just in ways we can't see so it also you can work this stuff out but again like i said it's ad hoc it's just saying every time we look for something it's just not where we see it and uh that that's just a deus ex machina you're just you're lowering god in by the uh machine right in where you need god to be to solve your uh problems so do i have anything smart to say does chat have anything smart to say let me know if you have any questions about this um also let me know um yeah hey look at that okay maybe this is working again let's try let's see if this works
Hey, yeah, so my stream deck decided it's going to work sometimes. Um, we'll find out if it holds up. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to, let's see, more to say. I'm not, I'm not wholly sure. I'm just trying to think, how would I go about solving this problem? Oh, I know. I've actually d worked a lot on the causal structure of evolution. I'd have to do something very, very different than what's going on here. And I can't really um, go into that now. It'd be a little too complex. Because, uh, yeah, get away. It'd take a while. But anywho, so this is it for this 